And so without further ado, the inductive approach, um, and by and large, of course, um, you know, it, it comes back to the fact that, you know, when we press switch, you know, where we, we expect things to happen, you know, we, you know, it's just what happens, you know, that, that, that's our experiences. Um, but, but of course, what we do recognize is that so that didn't come about by accident, of course, um, what, what I'm essentially going, going towards is the sort of the, the idea that um, we, we, we know what we know, because of course, it, it's, it's always happened in that way. But having said that, sometimes things go wrong. And of course, then we have to sort of track back what, what um, um, an inductive approach would try to sort of to um, uh, be well would, would not um, try but but would be deliberately based upon is that sort of we observe something happening and we can't make sense of it now it, it, what I'll do is I'll, I'll give you sort of a, a good example of the sort of the way in which and of course I'm, I'm getting to sort of the heart of what the sort of the um, you know, th this is about is that sort of science is really brilliant for solving scientific problems um, and you know, in that, that sort of sense, um, as the, the expression goes, you know, square pegs into sort of square holes and round pegs into obviously round holes and so on and so forth. And, and um, one of the ladies, and I can't, I can't remember the name, so I do apologise, was asking sort of you know, understanding the terms. What we get into, <coughs> excuse me, without sort of complicating things, is the sort of the, the ontology of the phenomena that we're interested in. And what ontology is, it's, it's, it's essentially, it's a sort of term that comes from sort of the, the nature of something. Now, what um, we've got to recognise is that if we're trying to um, study things which do not lend themselves to scientific principles, then perhaps we have to sort of use an alternative approach. And this is what the inductive approach is about. It's, um, and in essence, it's very much um, aligned and allied, if you like, and, and absolutely appropriate to sort of the, the non scientific world or the sort of the social worlds in which, of course, all of us interact. Um, I, you know, I've taught um, organizational uh, methods and behavior and you know, various other aspects, and you know, yeah, well, essentially management, if, if you know. If you want to sort of call it that, it's um, its widest perspective, and of course, the thing about management is it's about fundamentally about people. You know, we, and of course, what people come together as is an organisation. The question I always ask is that, you know, can you have an organisation without people? And of course, the the answer to that must um, be no, because of course, that's what an organisation is. If there are no people, it becomes a technical system. In which case, if um, it, it's it, it's subject to sort of the principles of sort of the of science and the sort of things that we'll we'll get onto when I talk about deductive methods. So what what we're getting to is the sort of the if there are things that we don't understand, then we have to sort of to adopt approach which actually explores. So it sets off from the principle that we don't necessarily sort of think we know the answer. We have a hunch. And, and, and to some extent, I, 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 this is often why the um, deductive approach comes first. And, and then what you can't do deductively, you do inductively. But I've, I've chosen to sort of do it the way around insofar as that if there are things we don't understand, because we have the, sort of the ability to go and explore uh, in greater depth, that that lends itself to sort of to um, greater ability to sort of to, to probe. Um, and most particularly in, in an organisational setting in particular, um, or any sort of social situation where, where people are involved, is to sort of to get them to give their explanations and accounts. And most particularly what, what you're trying to do, and I'm, I'm kind of summarising all the, the bullet points, but I'll go through them in a sort of moment, is that sort of that this doesn't start from, the, the, if you like, the grand theory approach. It starts from sort of have the, the desire to better understand and to better understand through the sort of the uh, elicitation or the exploration of data, which which lends itself to sort of to um, that that in depth appreciation of what's going on and why. And so uh, to to get to the sort of the bullet points, when we uh, adopt an inductive approach, what the researcher is doing is to sort of to put the focus on sort of data. Now, of course, the, the thing about this is, and I, I'll. Um, 
I'll answer this question is it uh, you know, how do you know what you you might or might not be looking for well of course again going back to ancient civilizations they didn't have the sort of the body of text that we have now we we have a profusion of some data sources like of, of literature sources let me get that right of literature sources which of course allows us to sort of go and read my experience is that depending upon the particular circumstances and of course there are always dependencies uh, or things that sort of don't work in the way that you want them to um but but if there's something that you don't understand it's normal to go and sort of read the sort of the the literature which pertains to it to see if that gives you any answers but the the inductive approach would suggest that yeah use literature but use it lightly insofar as that what you're really trying to do is to sort of get to sort of to to more uh, closely examine the uh, the situation to sort of to find out or to better understand what it is that's going on or not going on as the case may be and to to provide something which will allow you then to theory build so theory is the sort of the end result as opposed to sort of deductive approach which is about sort of um, um, coming from theory and creating a sort of often a research hypothesis so again uh, this is a big jump but once you've got some sort of data what is incumbent upon the researcher is to sort of to, to reflect upon what they've they've you know what are they 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 finding what does it tell us how does it stack up um and and of course at that point what you can start to do is to sort of to c compare and contrast to sort of the the the, um, the extant you know the existing literature but but most particularly what the research is doing you're looking for sort of patterns the things that sort of tell you the sort of or give you the um uh, the suggestions of what may be going on so which of course you can provide a better theory or better explanation as the sort of the case may be and okay and so again you know as i've said here accordingly when researchers adopt an inductive approach it's about starting with observations and moving from the, those experiences to a general set of propositions about the experiences so in this, if you like um and, and of course what people normally do in research is to sort of to jump straight into a hypothesis now of course i'm going to i'll, I'll do the final bullet point and i'll just give you a personal experience because i think that might be helpful so any sort of uh, inductive researcher is moving from data theory from the specific to the general and of course that that's often you know the the, the key to success in research because of course what we want are theories that tell us that, that these things are going to happen in all circumstances and again, coming back to sort of the, you know, I, I alluded to sort of um, flicking the switch and, you know, the computer turns on or the sort of the lights come on. Yeah, we, we kind of, we, we assume this will happen until it doesn't. And then if it doesn't, you know, quite clearly, if the lights don't come on, there's a problem with the electricity supply, you know, that there are various explanations. But of course, anybody who'd never seen electricity before, they, they wouldn't know that. It, it would seem quite incredible. But, but of course, by uh, reading the sort of literature they would fully understand that and and that's perfectly fine that in the sort of the, the technical world in which we live in things happen because of course this sort of, that's the sort of the nature of generating electricity and, and computer chips and, and programs you know that they, they do things in a sort of a very systematic way M my personal story is that so when i was embarking upon my own um, phd back in the sort of the, the 1990s you know, I was looking at sort of um, what's known or what are known as quality systems. And what I was trying to do was I, I started with the literature, which I have to say was a bit poor in regard to what I was interested in is the sort of what's going on. And, you know, in, in so far as in particular, that the literature was saying lots of wonderful things about quality systems that you'll get huge organizational benefits from uh, using these systems. And therefore, um, in terms of increased profits and uh, enhanced motivation, more efficiency, so grandiose claims. But of course, as I started to realise, without the sort of foundation of any evidence, what I um, came to the conclusion is a lot of this was written by people who had a vested interest in propagating what I called prop uh, sorry, uh, practitioner orientated literature. So it was intended to sell um, a message but without little or no foundation. In fact, in most cases, no foundation or data whatsoever. But anyway, okay, so, so I persisted. And it, um, what I tried to do was to sort of formulate hypotheses that sort of, you know, the introduction of quality systems would do various things. So classical hypothetico deductive research, which we're gonna come on to. Um, but the difficulty is that sort of what I then started to recognize is that lost things could be happening 
but it, they could be happening despite and not because of. And um, what I um, came to the conclusion is that sort of I was um, defying um, and, and disregarding, if I continued on this, one of the, sort of the, the classic tenets of, sort of, of and I'm going to use another word here, uh, positivism, but positivism is, is, is associated, or very, very sort of associated with um, deductive research of causality. One thing impacts upon another. And of course, anybody who's ever done any experimental research will know that sort of in a laboratory, um, researchers and those carrying out experiments are sort of absolutely sort of um, dedicated to controlling conditions because of course you want to make sure that there are no what we call extraneous variables creeping into the system. Now again I, I'm going to come back to this so I'm not going to sort of labour this point too much. So it, what it told me is that well okay I probably well I, I came to the conclusion I couldn't use a deductive approach because I couldn't control things because I was going out into organizations to discover what was going on or what to discover might be sounding a bit grandiose but certainly to sort of to explore and examine what was going on because there was definitely things happening people were doing things with varying degrees of success and failure I have to say um, and what I felt it was my job to do was to sort of try and observe what was going on to collect these experiences and to make sense of and by and large that's what my PhD was about but importantly and crucially it was about adopting a, an inductive approach where I was able to sort of to um, draw the inferences on the base of what I was um, discovering. Okay, I'm going to move on because, as I say, we, um, time is ticking along as usual. So, Van Manen, uh, John Van Manen, who's, if you've not come across him before and you are interested in his um, uh, methods of, of uh, going into organizations and understanding what goes on, he is a sort of wonderful writer. He originally did his research into sort of the New York police back in, I think it was the 1970s, um, and certainly they're very early 70s. He's been around for a long time, but he's, he's if you like, one of the sort of the uh, the long-standing um, influences in this regard. But anyway, he, he described qualitative methods. Now, of course, importantly, qualitative methods um, are the sort of the, 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 the basis of what uh, inductive approach is about. And again, well, I'll, I'll, um, well, you can read the definition there. An, an array of interpretive techniques to seek to describe, decode, translate, and otherwise come to terms with the meaning, not the frequency of certain more or less naturally occurring phenomena in the social world. And of course, what is at the heart of that is that sort of when we go into organizations, can we sort of codify? And of course, that's another word that you may come across. How do you actually measure what's going on? <coughs> Excuse me. And, you know, in a sort of an experiment, you're going to measure using whatever devices that are sort of appropriate. You know, so, for instance, if you're testing the, sort of the, the strength of the material um, to be used in whatever it might be in some engineering design, then yeah, that there are various um, tests that can be done to sort of to measure the, the strength of this, the, the, the shear force is often called. Um, and the reason I know about, a lot about this is I did this in my first degree uh, as an engineer. So I understand all of that. And of course they're quite precise, but, but they're measured in numerical terms. Now, and this is where we get into sort of very controversial territory, if, if you will, um, and many would disagree, but my personal view is that when you start to measure people, what is it that you're measuring? Yeah, for sure, we can measure their height, we can measure their weight, we can measure their, we can define their sort of eye colour, their hair colour, you know, the, the sort of the, the physical characteristics. But when we're, we're talking about things which are inherent and intrinsic to the, those people, such as motivation, can we sort of numerically measure motivation? And you know, I'll give you my answer. I don't think so. Um, that there are many who claim you can. I would suggest that some of those measures are um, superficial at best and wrong-headed in, in the extreme. But nonetheless, that there is a fact that, or you know, there is, there is no doubt, dare I say, it, that we we all have motivation. But I defy anybody um, today to think about their own motivation. Um, you know, okay, you might be able to think it on a scale, but what does that scale really mean? Because of course, what motivation is, it's a construct. Um, and of course, a construct is another wonderful word. It's a way, if you like, of trying to sort of take this, this, this abstract thinking and to sort of to put it into something which, which has a sort of meaning. And for sure, you know, we all undergo various stages of motivation as I was trying to sort of to, to examine in my own PhD research. But of course, people can describe it, but, but it's not so easy 
to um, talk about sort of these things in sort of numerical terms. And indeed, part of what I was involved in was looking at organisational culture that has a sort of very large impact upon the behaviour of people and you know determines their sort of their um, behaviour, sorry, that their behaviour, their, their their ability to interact and and create success. But of course, the thing about culture is anybody who's ever tried to measure culture, it's you know at best amorphous. It's it's you know, it's a kind of it's something which we all kind of think we know about. But but you know what does it really mean when we sort of boil it down? You know when we sort of uh, um, distill it, excuse me, to its its fundamental concepts. So it, what we were getting to all the time is the sort of the nature, the um, uh, dare I say, the, you know, it's the ontology. What does the thing consist of? And that's where the sort of the, the if you like the philosophical aspect. You know the, the, these are uh, well it, it and another word which I'll use in a minute. But in fact, I'll use it now. Epistemology, which I'll explain in a moment. These are Greek terms, which again the sort of the ancient Greek philosophers used to try and better understand um, those who are sort of reflecting upon the world around them. But once you understand or you, you you better appreciate the nature of the sort of the phenomena, it becomes possible to sort of think about the most appropriate method, which, of course, is what we're interested in, in this particular session. And that leads us into epistemology. And epistemology is just the sort of the, the branch of the discipline which allows you to select the most appropriate technique which lends itself to sort of, sort of studying the particular um, aspects of the phenomena that you're interested in. Okay, right, so to get back to sort of the slides, because as I say, we're, um, time is indeed ticking on. Emphasis is what goes on and why. So it's understanding this perspective uh, or from the perspective of the actors. And of course, that's the whole point about, I mean, okay, again, we're not talking about actors on stage, although, you know, they are fulfilling a role, is that people do things, they act in particular ways. Um, and one of the things I'd always like to add in is that what makes organisations such wonderful places, but so uh, um, incredibly frustrating for people who have to manage, um, or the, the managers who have to um, manage the sort of the behaviour, is that sort of people are intrinsically sort of, you know, individual and they can be erratic and, and irrational. Um, and that, that's part of the sort of the, the difficulty of, of handling organisation. They don't always do the things in the way that you do. Yeah, and for sure, people say, well, technical systems break down. But yeah, it, it's you know, so, something just you know, you know, one of the fusive blows or sort of one of the circuit balls you know, um, no longer works. Yeah, there's a technical solution to it. My <coughs> argument is that, sort of, that there are technical solutions to people, albeit that you know, perhaps um, psychologists claim that you can um, do this. You, you can't rewire people in the same way as you can do for, for machines or robots or whatever it might be. Uh, um, <coughs> what's important also about this is, and, and this is quite difficult, I have to sort of say, and of course it depends on the particular stance of the researcher, is this, this second sort of uh, point here, um, to be inductive rather than deductive, to avoid preconceived beliefs or reasons for action. Um, you might think you know what people are up to, um, but 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 it's it's up to people out there. You know, when you go into whatever setting you're in, um, or you're you're interested in sort of gaining access to, and some of you may be sort of practitioners examining your own organisations, is to sort of to get people to describe it in their own terms. Let, let them tell you what they think they're up to. Um, and, and of course, the, 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 sometimes this, this can be really cathartic. I certainly found this when I was doing my own research for people to actually describe um, to others and to sort of to, to allow themselves to reflect. Because quite often people do things in a sort of, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word, but it, it's, it's, it's not about mundanity. It, it's about the fact that they do it, they do it, they do it, and they, and they, they, you know, they, it, it, it's, they, they do it without thinking. Um, but of course, um, it was when they have the time to reflect that they can actually sort of start to make greater sense. Now, I, I've, I've kind of covered this point, but again, it's worth restating. Um, the focus on collecting data that's largely not numerical. <coughs> Numbers may have a part to play, and I do accept that. But of course, what you're trying to do is to sort of get the sort of the, what we call the thick descriptions. And what we mean by that is the sort of the um, uh, interview data, perhaps, where you sort of, you go and talk to people, and ideally you sort of record what they say, and then that, that provides the basis of the descriptions that you can then interpret to sort of to make sense of what's going on and why. Oops, gone too far. So again, to, to, to have some sort of useful points here, literature has a relevance, but I suggest it's a starting point for investigation. And indeed, that there's a sort of very good argument that you put literature to one side 
um, and then come back to it once you've sort of collected the data and then compare and contrast. And don't, dare I say it, be surprised if you find that quite a lot of the literature that you you may have read to start off with, it doesn't actually sort of um, uh, provide particularly accurate accounts or faithful accounts of what's going on and why. Um, but again, you know, I, I would always stress it's it's about sort of the you know, the the nature of the phenomena, which of course is normally about sort of people operating in social situations. So access is important. And again, one of the sort of the the ladies that I was talking to at the outset um, about the sort of the five different themes. Well, you know, the most important thing to think about is that well, where will I go to get my data? And if it is in, dare I call it, organisational social situations, yeah, you know, that there are some things which are going to be easy to get into or some organizations but the the world we live in is is strange you know given how much information is, is available it's much more closed than perhaps it used to be and there's a whole re set of reasons for that but don't assume that an organization will give you access in fact always working as the, the basis that it's it's you know it's difficult and, and they may not do so you've got to find a really good reason for uh, if you're an outsider why would that organization allow you uh, unfettered access to what goes on and why there's a whole set of sort of risks you know that they'll be fully aware of um and you know dare i say it, that these will be also covered by the ethics that you will have to sort of to consider uh, normally as part of any sort of um uh, universities um internal procedures and this is why also if, if you're doing internal based research um, uh, and you are a practitioner examining your own uh, organization this actually sort of short circuits if he says you're using a sort of a technical term but it, it certainly it, it, it um, deals with a lot of the problems of access albeit that you would have, obviously you, you can't just start researching without telling people because there's, there's a whole set of ethical considerations to that so you have to be um, uh, overt about that albeit that there, it is possible to sort of to adopt what we call covert techniques but you know that they are loaded with problems um but sometimes that may be the only way that you can get access to the organization but then yeah as i say universities are really sort of um concerned about sort of covert research because of course quite often they they can be dangerous situations um indeed there was another sort of um, uh, um piece of work which i sort of read oh many many years ago by someone called daniel wolf and it was actually researching motorcycle gangs now, of course, everyone knew they existed, but the likes of the sort of like, like, fused expression, but it wasn't um, them in particular. It was another um, version of the, sort of the Hell's Angels. Um, and if you've not come across the, that, that expression before, um, look it up. But of course, they're, they're, they're essentially outlaw motorcycle gangs. Um, and indeed, they, they happily proclaim their sort of their, their ability to be beyond the law, as it were. Um, but of course, they don't welcome sort of uh, outsiders because of the sort of fact that they're involved in, as we sort of call it, nefarious activities. So what he had to do was to sort of to um, um, do the initiation and you know, pretend to sort of join. But, and, and of course, he found some wonderful stories and he, he was able to sort of to research this, this organisation from the inside. And then, of course, he had the sort of the dilemma because they have this, this code. that If you break sort of the amatra, the silence, a bit like the sort of the mafia, then um, you are sentenced to death. So I, I, it's a long time since I read it, but he, he found a way of resolving that, but it was it, it had its difficulty. Anyway, access is sort of, uh, is important. So bear that in mind, you're gonna keep that at the sort of the, the forefront of your sort of uh, um, thought processes. Have a range of questions because of course, and, and they don't have to be uh, specific, but you know, all you, uh, but what you must also do though, is to sort of keep copious notes and ideally to have, if you can, um, tape record interviews uh, of all the things that go on because of course what you are is providing descriptions um, which will help to sort of to as I say provide the sort of the depth of knowledge about the organization and what's going on and why uh, which is the sort of the fourth bullet point and, and the other thing is that what happens is as you start to immerse yourself in this it's 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 a fairly long process but of course you do develop confidence um and your ability to sort of provide that that sort of in-depth analysis will make you a much better researcher okay um seven key differences to quantitative methods and of course you're going to say well hold on what, what are quantitative methods but if you're not but i'm saying it well of course they are the sort of the, the um the approaches which lend themselves to deductive methods we're going to come on to in a couple of minutes so the emphasis less pronounced yeah, again, coming back to what we were talking about just before this presentation, think about what's interests you, what's going to keep you going during the sort of the difficult times. 
the context is always important, but of course, context shifts, and of course, everything has a sort of reason. So that your um, role and job will be to sort of to describe that that context and to provide a better sense of why things are happening at a particular time. And you know, dare I say, it, the uh, context of my own research is that sort of organisation didn't all wake up coincidentally inside the organ introduce quality systems. They were told by the government that because of a government approach to sort of improving quality, that they were all going to have to introduce quality assurance in um it was actually what was known as british standard 5750 in those days but of course it's now the international standard iso 9000 so the context of that you know provided the sort of the background how people dealt with it was the sort of the interesting aspect thinking about the processual issues of what um change is about you know what's driving this change and the sort of um providing the uh, an indication of variations because as, as i want to say is um, not everything is happening in the same way, and that, that's the nature of organisations. And, and indeed, even in the organisations that I've researched, it, does, it doesn't always happen in a consistent way. That, that, that's the sort of the nature of what goes on, and quite clearly, you know, certain people leave and certain people come in, and you know, that has a sort of huge influence. <coughs> Excuse me, much less structured um, than, in, uh, uh, um, than a, a deductive quantitative approach. Um, no need for closed questions because, of course, the thing about a closed question, you ask a closed question, you know, what time do you get up this morning? You know, there's, you know, there's only one answer to that. Whatever time you got out of bed, you know, do you feel good or bad? Yeah, I mean, closed questions, you know, that they, they they are good because, of course, they 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 kind of um, they provide a, a specific answer. But of course, it doesn't give you sort of the in-depth exploration or the, the ability to sort of engage in in-depth exploration that sort of an inductive approach would. All things are considered, so you, um, part of the background is documents, procedures, the, the sort of the hermeneutics, if you like, of an organisation. Everything provides the sort of the background context and will be important and influence people's behaviour and actions. Um, and it's up to you to sort of to, to, um, to provide some sort of indication, well, not some indication, to provide accurate indication on the basis of the accounts that you're given as to sort of what the nature of that sort of uh, influence is. Okay, and, and most particularly, um, this last point is important. You become actively involved. I use the expression immersed, and quite often this is why. So I really like the the the, the, um, the approach of um, ethnographic research, where of course you sort of go and be in the organisation and see it from the inside, because of course there's always a danger that as a sort of an outsider, that's all that you're ever seen as, and there is this this issue, and I, it's, it's a problem. I accept that people will only tell you what they think you want to hear. But, but normally when you sort of, you, you do this along, the people relax. And also, it, depending upon the circumstances, why would they tell you lies? But of course, um, yeah, the, the, the argument is that sort of, um, questionnaires are better, but you know, I've seen people fill in questionnaires and they, they fill out the numbers that first come into their head. So, so there's the, what I'm saying here is, it's not a fire and forget mission. So you do have to sort of dedicate a fair amount of time. And time is, of course, uh, getting beyond us now. Of course, um, I'm going to sort of deal with this very quickly. Interviewing. So, of course, you know, it's where you go and sort of talk to someone face to face and get them to sort of to, you know, to, to uh, talk in very general terms about what you're interested in. You know, obviously, it has to sort of to, it's not just a chat. It's about the specific phenomena that you're interested in. So in my case, it's quality systems or I don't, it could be anything, leadership in an organisation, you know, corruption, if you want to talk, get people to talk about that, if they'll, they'll go on the record. Um, and the thing is, though, what you, you, you're getting them to do is to sort of to surface their own understanding of what's going on and why. Because what this will sort of often do, it will allow things to sort of to, um, to, well, to, to use that expression again, to surface, to sort of to come to the fore which you may not have thought about, you may not have thought about, you may not have even seen in the literature, but of course, people in the sort of the organizational setting, they might be aware of, or that it's important to them. And of course, what this has the sort of capacity to do is to sort of shift the sort of the, the, the focus. And of course, that's the other thing I think you, you probably have to be aware of, um, is that sort of you, you, you've got to be fairly flexible in your approach, because of course, things can change as you go along. Um, and of course, as I've said here, you can use standard questions, which of course you know, is, is often useful, as it were, to use a sort of standard list of questions that you ask of all the participants, but then get them to you know, provide open-ended uh, answers, in which case they sort of describe them in the terms suitable to them. Case studies, again, you know, well, case studies where you sort of go into one or maybe a number of organisations um, and you know, it, it builds upon everything I've just been saying about sort of the idea of trying to sort of to explore in depth 
but of course, as you may be able to sort of to already um, um, understand, this is not something which is a sort of trivial exercise. It takes a lot of time to negotiate the access, a lot of time to get in and talk to people and develop the relationships, a lot of time to sort of carry out the interviews an observation and reading documents so and this is why you know if, if somebody comes along and says i'm going to I don't know, examine 20 case studies um i'm saying well yeah good luck because you're probably not going to be able to complete that in, in a lifetime um and, and normally what you uh, one good case study um you know in depth is better than sort of a whole lot of um you know, superficial sort of uh, approaches but hey you know different people have different uh, views on this but but case studies um, it's about the sort of the what goes on in the organization, the specifics. Um, and of course, the thing is, though, you know, coming back to sort of the, the original intention, it's to sort of, if you can, to provide explanations, theories. But of course, the thing about theories is people like to believe that they operate in all circumstances. Yeah. And, and again, to light the light bulb that you know, it, once you develop a theory of motivation, it'll always work in, in, you know, in every um, context and every sort of uh, particular circumstance. Yeah, it, and, and as we know, that's not the sort of nature. Different things happen in different ways for reasons, which of course are particular to the circumstances that uh, exist. Okay. Action research. Um, again, you know, you, you may come across this. And I'll, I'll, um, uh, you know, this is a worthy of a sort of a future session. I think we're we'll probably doing a sort of session in sort of the um, 2022 on this. But this is the idea that, and it, it's either you as an outsider or internally, you have an idea about creating change. And essentially, it, it's quasi-experimental insofar as you introduce something new, some alteration to practice, or some new technique or pr procedure and what then happens is that you observe the impact upon people and how they cope with it how they sort of they interact and deal with the sort of the whatever this thing is um and see whether it, it has the sort of the the um, rate of success or perhaps failure to, you know, and obviously you don't want that but of course that may happen um you, you look at it um from all perspectives to see what's going on and why. And okay, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna sort of carry on because time is starting to run out. Okay, deductive research is actually, it, you know, I, I, it's, it's in many ways so much easier because of course it's the idea, you begin with a theory and of course from that theory, um, you try and test it. So you have a theory that I, again, coming back to my own circumstances, that there was a particular technique called quality assurance you introduce it into your organization and your organization becomes more effective, efficient, cost of, uh, well, it, it, it decreases costs, uh, motivates people. And there, there's a whole list of other sort of factors, any of which of course I could test. But, but uh, and again, you know, I'm um, reflecting on the fact that I found difficulty because of course I couldn't sort of operationalize the sort of research in that way. But what we're talking about here is the, sort of the idea that you want to sort of to, um, to explicitly use a, a, a scientific approach whereby you sort of uh, you're testing the sort of the the connection between one thing and at least one other sort of um variable so the, the independent variable and the dependent variables um and then to sort of just to uh, monitor the sort of the um the causality of the change in the dependent variables as a sort of consequence of in, uh, the impact and introduction of the dependent variable and now, of course, um, what I would stress to you is that that works very well in a sort of scientific, sorry, in a sort of scientific um, approach, but, but in a sort of laboratory situation where you can control the variables. But of course, when we're talking about, as I've just been mentioning, without agonizing too much about that, um, when you come outside of the laboratory, it's much harder to, sort of, to uh, control things in the sort of the, that, that sort of um, um, sterile environment, if you will. Okay, and, and, and so in effect, Everything I've just been talking about in terms of inductive, this is the opposite to, so just you know, if you like work backwards. Um, so as I said in the second bullet point, the research commences with a theory, question or hypothesis that they believe to be true. And the idea then is to sort of collect data that will sort of verify um, um, or provide veracity, the truthfulness of that sort of that, um, uh, that, you know, that, that hypothesis. Um, and of course, what you're then into, of course, is collecting numerical data, which you can then um, carry out a number of statistical tests. So of course, what you've then got to be able to do is to sort of to understand the sort of the way in which, um, well, certainly causality occurs, but of course, the sort of the uh, collinearity 
as the sort of the statisticians would say, where of course it's the sort of the statistical significance, you know, is, it, is, is the sort of the, the theory that you had proved or disproved within certain sort of uh, limits. So, you know, the more data you produce, the sort of the better. Um, and obviously, of course, as is uh, the case in any research, it is about sort of data, but of course it has to be sort of data which is um, lends itself to that sort of testing. Uh, again, this is why I, I don't think you can have um, uh, qualitative data and carry out statistical testing because you know, it's it's just nonsense. Because the, 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 what are you testing? That you know, statements, that the truthfulness of sort of what people say. But but again, let's that, not go backwards, as it were. So again, the difference with this one, of course, is that sort of heavy emphasis at the beginning is placed upon the literature where you develop your thoughts. And most particularly, you, you, whereas um, in fact, we did a um, presentation last week, we talked about sort of research gaps, but of course, what you're looking for in the, sort of the existing literature is something which you think doesn't tell the whole story or uh, you, somebody has not measured the impact of one thing or another. And that's your gap or your novel, novel proposition um, that you're going to be able to sort of to hypothesis test. And of course, what you're, um, you know, this is essentially doing is to sort of to come from the theory and to sort of to use theory as the sort of the, um, the, the tools and techniques or the sort of the base upon which you build the subsequent research. Okay, um, number of conventions. These come from, as you see, a sort of fairly um, uh, old source, but you know, um, the French 19th century social theorist, Auguste Comte. Um, and of course, what this is about is positivism. So I did mention that sort of word earlier on, so you can see there. Positivism is about deduction, and positivism ha has the five tenets that the independence of the research from what's being observed, and of course, you know. Uh, dare I say, if you go into a laboratory and test the sort of, uh, you know, an inanimate object such as a, I don't know, piece of steel, um, that you're not interested in what the steel thinks about because, of course, it has no ability to think. Um, um, you know, that, and that's the sort of the, the, the issue. There's, there's the, whereas, of course, if you go into a, a social setting, people do um, know what you're up to, or at least they, they have opinions and they may not even like what you're up to, but, but nonetheless, um, you know, that, that, that is it. So, so independence of the researcher. And of course, what we get into is this of the whole aspect of trying to sort of be researchers being flies on the wall and all that sort of thing. Essentially also um, what goes with this is value neutrality. So you, you try to sort of to um, avoid having any sort of particular views but as a sort of an independent researcher, you're merely sort of trying to sort of to you know, work with what the sort of the data tells you or the sort of hypothesis, collect the data, and then to see what the statistical sort of um, techniques that you use on that data tell you. Um, you you're not trying to you know, get to the conclusion, as it were. You, you may have a sort of a hunch about what the sort of the, the hypothesis may be, but as I say, you're trying to sort of to uh, control the, um, the emotions as much as possible, difficult as that also may be. I've, I've mentioned this, of course, causality. This is absolutely sort of essential to sort of to uh, deduction. It's the sort of the idea that there is a connection between one thing and another. And obviously, if you cannot find a connection, it cannot be true. So your, your hypothesis is, is um, you know, proven not to be true, which, which may be a sort of finding in itself. And indeed, that there is the sort of the idea of the sort of the, the black swan theory, that um, black swans exist until you find that they, they don't exist. And of course, um, you know, as we sort of know, if you keep sort of searching, you may eventually find them. And when you don't find them, they mustn't exist. But, but hey, you know, that these are sort of philosophical questions, which I'll, I'll leave for you to consider in due course. So, so the idea, as I've also mentioned, independent, dependent, extraneous variables well, is a direct manifestation of concern with causality. And also generalization applies the assumption that the findings of the research can be used to make predictions. And of course, this is the whole point that people get confused about with theory, that when you come up with a theory or a theory that evolves from or emerges from deductive approach, it, it should be true. You know? And again, dare I say it, the scientific world we live in is based upon our understanding sort of of the sort of the, the way in which the, um, the environment and physics works, certainly on this planet. And I, I know that um, it, these laws of uh, science may not apply in outer space, but nonetheless, here on uh, good old planet Earth, you know, we know that if we sort of create, create energy um, through um, whatever it might be, um, uh, <clears throat> the, the, uh, the, the cycles or sort of um, magnetic induction, to use this sort of another term, so I'll mix it up, so maybe I shouldn't do that, but, but yeah, we, we create ele electrical power, which drives us of our, um, our worlds, and, and you know, we, we rely upon that, so you know, that we use the sort of the science that we understand. 
in a way which of course allows us to sort of drive the world that we have and you know of course as we know we, we drive our cars on the basis of sort of the um you know the, the nature of energy whether it be petrol or diesel and of course increasingly we'll be using sort of um electricity but of course that has still has to be created in the first place it, it just come out of thin air the, the other final one um is reductionism and of course this is the sort of the reduction is the idea you try and reduce the simple elements to make the research um operate um and easier to, to achieve but of course, the sort of the reality is, and this is why, again, to sort of to put that my claim in for sort of um, uh, induction, of course, the sort of world is often sort of much more complex and reductionism does mean that you sort of you casually ignore things and you do so at your peril. OK, for the last few minutes, I'm, I'm pretty sure I've gone on. It's taken longer, but certainly for the next five minutes or so, I'm just going to sort of to to make a claim or at least to sort of deal with the sort of the idea that there is the sort of the. Uh, um, uh, belief you know, that, that, um, that you can use what's called mixed methods so in essence you can I use my hands here so you can't see this you can do some deduction and some induction and one follows the other and again you know i've seen plenty of this done um and again you know the, the thing is that as we've just sort of said and i don't probably need to agonize about this that yeah, on the left hand side you've got the sort of qualitative research so files words you know interviews all the sort of the the you know the really in-depth stuff that's that's going to be sort of um interesting but you know quite time consuming and of course on the, the right hand side you've got the quantity so um, inductive deductive and the numerical data which you then use to sort of to count the deductive research so i can move on whoops as this builds up okay mixed method there you go okay so <laughs> um so that there, there is a sort of method for for doing this and various approaches which of course uh, what i do like about sort of induction is that sort of it gives you a great deal of flexibility whereas in this sort of uh, quantitative deductive approach um all of this is normally fixed before you carry out the experiment you don't start sort of changing the sort of the um the, um, the rules of what you're doing halfway through because that will lead to sort of all sorts of problems uh, excuse me, on the left hand side, it's about having different paradigms, different sort of um, thought processes, um, and you, know, you mix them all up. And of course, that's where you get your mixed methods. Now, of course, in theory, it works really well. Um, again, you know, as I say, it's quite obvious you sort of use both, you mix them, yeah, you can do it concurrently, one after the other. Um, my tip would be if you're going to do, do it in any particular order, do the qualitative um, uh, inductive approach we use the inductive approach first off to gain the deeper understanding once you've done that then develop questionnaires if you will to sort of go out to a much wider population so perhaps you know, do, do an in-depth case study and from that generate a sort of um, uh, questionnaire if that's what you want to do but having said that people do these different approaches and quite often that they do, they do the other way around they do the sort of the uh, quantitative first followed by the qualitative and okay it's examined in whichever way it's examined because of course that's always the the key to success isn't it convince your examiners okay mixed methods it's both a method and methodology for conducting research that involves collecting analyzing and integrating quantitative and qualitative research in a single study or a longitude program of inquiry depends what you want to do of course um, the purpose of this research is it's uses it to develop better understanding which of course is all any researchers are interested in whatever works in the way that you want it to work is fine but oh, oh sorry sorry I'm, 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 I missed this slide um so of course um I, I, I don't probably need to sort of to um do much on this because you know we've said it all before um it, it, it's it's providing if you like different perspectives which are very useful if it works well so again using the qualitative um, to generalize findings to a large population which of course is exactly what i've just sort of said so using the sort of the the in-depth understanding to sort of to get to sort of to a questionnaire approach which will generate the numbers if you you believe that they are appropriate and lend themselves to sort of what you're going to do um again the reasons for using um a mixed method okay if you truly believe that sort of using one or other is inefficient so in, insufficient in its um, um on its own multiple angles you know so by, by looking at it from these different perspectives you you certainly get a sort of a much better view if indeed if that's possible if you can generate sort of the the data that's required 
Uh, the more evidence, the better argument combining qualitative and quantitative. It certainly does provide loads of evidence. Um, some believe that this is a really appropriate method to use. I, I'm, I must admit, I'm a bit, bit more agnostic on that. Um, <laughs> the, the eager to learn argument is the latest methodology. Well, yeah, there's a degree of that. Um, and of course, the, the, the intuitive argument mirrors real life because that's what we do. We, we, we kind of we, we have a bit of experience and then we sort of go off and read the manuals about why things go wrong and then we develop better understanding of the science and then we sort of we use it. But, but we sort of often adapt the sort of the um, uh, what we're doing. There's a couple of diagrams here, but of course, these will be available. And again, all it is is it's, it's just the same. In fact, it's, it's, it's swap, swap the sort of the qualitatives on this side. Um, and quantitative on this side, but again, yeah, 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 how you sort of um, use the sort of particular techniques is left up to uh, um, the researcher. Um, and indeed, you know, here's another one um, where you're sort of using it in a sort of um, a sequ sequential slash, uh, sequ <laughs> sequential design approach. And of course, you see here in year one, you're using or maybe year two after you've done some sort of uh, preliminary sort of research and um, uh, you know, reading of the literature, perhaps. But you're sort of qualitative, then you follow it by the sort of the quantitative, which I've um, been saying. You know, and, and of course, that 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 may be absolutely fine. Uh, and indeed, you know, there are um, methods there you can sort of see for sort of to uh, analyze sub uh, data. But of course, that's for another session. Um, you can embed it, which of course, of course, that looks like this might involve you being in the organization and using different approaches. Now that, that, that could probably work pretty well. You know, um, what sort of the numbers tell you in um, the organization and you then back it up by sort of doing in-depth interviews with the sort of the people involved. I'm really conscious of the fact that, you know, time is going to run out, but, but again, here's a sort of really good slide, which actually sort of nicely summarizes the sort of connecting, merging, embedding. And that, that there are different methods of doing this. And I, I'm, I'm really conscious that it might start to seem a bit um, complicated. But what I didn't want to do is, of course, is to sort of to um, leave you with the sort of the sense that this is easy. Because what you're essentially doing now, once you get into mixed methods, you've got to essentially be a master of two techniques. Um, again, I, 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 I happily admit that I spent probably a year in my own PhD agonized hours did part-time so the, the year was not full-time I would have but you know six months of, of full-time PhD equivalent agonized about how to use um, quantitative methods or sort of a hypothetical deductive, deductive approach and then I abandoned it but but of course I, you know, I, I learned so much about the sort of the, the frailties and the problems of sort of using this approach that that's what sort of um, uh, influenced me to use a, 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 an inductive qualitative interpretive approach but of course, what's being said in bullet point one, you, you can spend lots and lots of time on these things and it becomes time consuming, expensive. Um, and the problem is, of course, as individuals like machines, but, but, you know, but, but in a different way, you become worn out by the sort of the, the, the never endingness of a sort of um, a PhD and a PhD, you know, three years full time, five to six years part time, which tends to be about the sort of the, the minimum. Um, if you sort of try and do too many things, it becomes problematic. So I, I would you know, add that health warning. And of course, the, the other thing is that, that you know, this is my, my big concern is that quite often quantitative and qualitative research, inductive deductive research, they tell you things which are not the same. They, they, they give you different perspectives. And that this, this, may, this inconsistency may be problematic and difficult to reconcile. So you've got to be aware of that sort of issue. And indeed, you know, the, the fact is, sh should they sort of naturally align? Well, if, if they do, um, and they sort of, they are consistent with one another. That that's a bonus. But but don't be surprised if, um, as I say, by different uh, by adopting different approaches, you get different answers, um, because that's that's the sort of the natures of the endeavour. Indeed, quantitative research is intended to be objective. Now, of course, this is the idea that you can measure things, um, because that's what objective is about. Whereas qualitative is subjective. Um, and of course, you know, things are going on, you can describe them, but you can't necessarily measure them. And of course, you know, when you try and put these two together, they are, um, you know, to come back to the analogy of the sort of the, the two boxes, that, you know, they, 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 they're kind of acting against one another. And that, that made part of the difficulty. Okay, um, of course, the, the, uh, the difficulty you may have, of course, is that when you set out, you know, having sort of the um, the data, sorry, the data that, that will lend itself to both these and the experience, it can be sort of problematic. So be prepared for a bit of a long haul. 
Um, the researcher has to have used to, or learn to use multiple methods and to, to mix them and to do it in a way which, of course, shows um, both be, the ability to be systematic but also consistent. I'm kind of in this camp, really, as the methodological purists. I believe that sort of researchers should pick one or the other and stick with it. Um, there's a sense that if you're sort of um, trying to sort of you know, use both, you, you've not quite decided. So you're kind of um, you're mixing and matching. You know, you're riding two horses or trying to sort of sit on two stools or you know, perhaps just to put it more prosaically, you just haven't the confidence to sort of to do one or the other. So you do both. But there is then a danger that if you use both, you do both in a sort of kind of superficial and um, or, or carry out in a way which is not as persuasive as by, by being much better about the sort of the and, and much more proficient and confident in sort of the the the, um, uh, the the technique that you've decided to use right at the outset. But of course, the difficulty is, as I always appreciate, for sort of those starting out on the sort of the, the research journey. You don't know because you've never done it. And of course, the whole point about sort of the PhD, it's an apprenticeship. And anybody who knows about anything about apprenticeships knows that you make mistakes. And a, you know, a bit like my you know, um, spending six months, well, 12 months um, in real time as a part time student um, agonizing about this. You know, it, it, yeah, it, it was part of the sort of the experience what I had to sort of learn to get there. And again, you know, riding two horses is very sensible. Well, okay. And perhaps that, that's the sort of the point at which to sort of to leave you. Now, of course, um, I'm pretty sure that it, it's taken long to get to this. I didn't think I'd, it would do. But of course, you know, what we're talking about is the sort of the, the nature of the sort of research process and philosophy. So there's a lot packed in here. And as um, um, you, you may be aware, um, Dr. Hub has got a lot more sort of um, um, sessions to sort of provide, um, I believe we'll be doing a lot more of this in sort of 2022, where you'll learn more about the specific sort of um, aspects and techniques which I sort of uh, alluded to in the sort of the, uh, the research. And of course, as this slide shows, um, there are plenty of, of other uh, courses. Indeed, there is sort of one, the identification, sorry, issue identification, problematizing, and research question framing, um, which comes in sort of three formats. In fact, this is a good time for sort of for me to stop sharing and to introduce uh, or bring Jack back in, who might like to say a few words. So actually, I might actually call on Anna on that about uh, some of the uh, yeah, different. Right, yes, I, I can see Anna's there as well. So, Anna yes. is, is one of the, the co-founders. Of sort of Hub, so so she, she'll be able to sort of to deal with any issues that you have. And in fact, just for a couple of minutes, because, you know, um, are, are there any immediate questions? So please um, unmute yourself. But, but, but I will invite Anna to sort of to be involved at this point. Anybody wish to put, um, ask a question? May please? I shortly suggest one thing, Jake? Would you like to stop recording just in case someone? Yes, shall do. Thank you.